One thing I forgot to tell you guys, um, Ani, thank you for keeping me in check. Um, you're going to see on the back tables, when we have our social time, these things are light bulbs. They're energy efficient light bulbs. We, there was a gentleman in town that had this vision that he wanted to give out to the churches, to give out to people, light bulbs. Now with it, what happened was, he provided the case to this and it says light to salvation. It's actually an evangelistic tool. What I did was I put one of our ink light cards in the middle of the bulb so they don't break. I want these bulbs gone. Okay? Like, picture like being like a going out of business sale or I'm out of business. Um, take these bulbs with you. Okay? And if you want more, I can get you more. We have some more here. Um, we put like some bags over here that are like uh, care packages we did yesterday. But take them too. We got some devotions and stuff. And like I said, you, can, you know, you can keep the bowls for yourself and or hand them out. Let's keep you awake, okay? All right, let's get into the sermon here. Um, we're talking about the attributes of God. Who is he? You know, like a lot of people and myself included, we, we look at God and we go, okay, what is our view of God? Is he this mean, nasty guy that says sinner, bad, everything else? Is he this anything goes kind of guy? Is he one minute he flips a coin and says Steve's okay, and next minute he says Dallas man sitting in front to distract him? Okay. Um, you know, whatever it may be, but see, our view of God can be factored by many things. If we've had a, a father or an absentee father, we may think that he doesn't love us. If we've had an abusive father, we could think that all he wants to do is hurt us. You know what I mean? There's a lot of factors that go into this. But the attributes that he has are listed in the Bible. It's just a few of them. So we've been going through a few of them, but this one is talking about the ever-presence of God. The subject, or the, the title is, I'm right here. I love that picture. There, the guy's hanging on to Jesus, and he's on his knees, he's hanging on. You ever felt like that? It's like, have you ever had a moment where you just thought he was gone? Like all of a sudden it was like, okay, you believed in me and now, boom, I drop you. Many people have had those moments. Sometimes people leave their faith, they say, which if you're born again, you can't leave him. You can turn your back. He's never going to forsake you. And so... One of the things that um, Deuteronomy 31 6 says, be strong and courageous, do not be afraid or terrified because of them. It's talking about the Israelites going into a uh, new land. For the Lord God, uh, for the Lord your God goes with you, he will never leave you nor forsake you. I say it to people all the time, he will never leave you nor forsake you. I say it to me all the time when I think he's gone, he will never leave me nor forsake me. That means he's not going to turn his back on us. Even when Everything looks like it's empty and out. Everything looks like it's falling apart. Everything, all, all hell is breaking loose, okay? And, and, and I have to remember that scripture. He will never leave me nor forsake me. He's ever present. He's here. Although we may not see him, he's here. He sees it all. He sees the hurts and pains. He sees the highs and lows. He sees people all over the world and the craziness that goes on. And sometimes people say, well, what, why, what? How could that be? How could he allow that? Well, we're going to get into that today, okay? The tough question. You know, how could a loving God allow that to happen? So, questions like, where is God when I feel so alone? Where is God when I'm in my darkest hour? Where is God when I need him the most? Where was God when my spouse walked out on me and the kids? Where was God when I was in the hospital? Where was God when my child was killed in a car accident? Where was God when 9-11 happened? See, there are many questions and legitimate questions that we all have. And when I do funerals, it gives me a green light to ask those questions to people without sounding overly religious. 
because I'm just asking the question. I remember doing a funeral for a four-year-old, one of the toughest ones I've ever done. A child drowned in a pool that the father was actually in the pool with him and didn't realize it until it was too late to use at the bottom of the pool. It happened so quick. And he beat himself up about that like you wouldn't believe. And as you're walking and paying respects to the child, you see these little, these little bicycle trike, and you see like, you know, little toys and stuff lying around, and you go, how could a loving God allow that to happen? Why didn't he step in? Why, why, why was that? Well, guess what? I'm here to tell you that he knew what was going on. We have an internal perspective to look at. This world is not all that you see. We have an eternal perspective to look at. God looks at things in way deeper ways than we do. We look at that and say, that's a tragedy that should happen. Blah, blah, blah. But where is that child right now? If we could see right now and peel back heaven, we'd say, wow, look at how he's being blessed. He's in the arms of the Father. Does that take away the pain of the parents? No. But it's a different perspective. We're going to look today at something uh, in that subject. So it's going to get a little dark for a moment. But I want to encourage you through it. That wherever you are in life, God is with you. Did you hear me? Wherever you go, whatever happens, He's still with you. He didn't take a hiatus. He doesn't take smoke breaks. He doesn't get a, a, you know, a vacation, sick time, and all that. He's with us all the time. Can you guys say it with me? All the time. Ready? Go again. All the time. The reason why I'm saying that is to reaffirm. I want you to reaffirm yourself. He's there with you all the time. Because there's going to be moments, if you are not going through it already, where you may feel that way. I know I get like that. I'm like, okay, he must have taken the, you know, taken my family and went to Disney World without me. I'll just sit here and sulk and just figure out what I'm going to do. And then what we do is we make bad decisions, right? Well, I guess God left, so there goes that idea. So let me figure it out. And then we make a real bad trail, right? No, we're not good at that, Aaron. Next slide, son. Psalm 139, verse 7 through 12 says this. Because God is ever-present... He is always with me. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your hand, your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. I think I should probably put that in, like blow it up and put it on the wall in the church, like Trinity United Methodist, when we do code blue. Because there's a lot of darkness with the people, the, the, you know, the, the clientele, if you would, that we have. Because all they can see is this darkness. They go out into it and, and, and don't have a home. We go home and it's like, okay, we're home, right? And you brush your teeth and you go to the bathroom and then you get your TV and all that. They don't have none of that. Some of them it's by their own choice. Some of them it's not. But when you have to go out and survive, where do you go? What do you do? Is there anybody there for you? God is. Next slide. Where was God when World War II happened? I'm going to take you down a little history road. Some of you, you know, maybe like, what's well, World War II? It's okay. Take a trip with me back to 1933 when Adolf Hitler took control of ruling Germany. There he is. And at that time, the Enabling Act of 1933 was signed, which gave Adolf Hitler the power to enact laws without the involvement of what they call the Reichstag. It's almost like their Congress. Yeah. 
Yeah, so 97% is what Dave said. Um, approval rating. But then all of a sudden he turned. This man is responsible for over 6 million Jews being killed for no reason. Next, next slide, son. This is what happened. I want you to see this. This is like a timeline, okay? It's a little bit of a history lesson, but trust me, stay with it, okay? Because it's going to build into what we're talking about here. All right? 1933, when he gets elected and they do that, here's what starts happening. Public burning of books by Jews and anti-Nazis. That was their party. Random acts on Jews and Jewish property. Police and the courts no longer protect Jews. April boycotts of Jewish shops for one day. Germans are, are told not to buy from shops and businesses owned by Jews. Uh, I don't know what that essay, what does that essay stand for, Dave? What do you think? That might be like just their, maybe their police or something. People stand by shops to, dis, to discourage people from going inside. It's probably like their Gestapo or something. Kosher, rituals, uh, ritual slaughter of animals, banned. A uh, Department of Racial Hygiene or Ethnic Cleansing is established. 1934, Jewish students excluded from exams in medicine, dentistry, pharmacy, and law. Jews excluded from military service. 1935, Nuremberg laws deny Jews many basic civil rights. Law for, for the protection of German blood and German honor forbade mixed marriages. 1936, Jews no longer allowed to vote and lose German citizenship. Benefit payments to large Jewish families are stopped. Jews banned from parks, restaurants, and swimming pools. Jews forbidden to use the German in greeting Hill Hitler. Jews no longer allowed electrical, optical equipment, bicycles, typewriters, or records. Passports for Jews to travel abroad are restricted. Many Jewish students removed from German schools and universities. 1938, special identity cards issued for Jews. Jews excluded from cinema, theater, concerts, exhibitions, beaches, and holiday resorts. Jews forced to add the name Sarah or Israel to their own. I can't pronounce that, but it's uh, November 9th, a night of terrible violence in Germany. German and Austrian Jews are murdered, synagogues burned and desecrated, um, and shop windows destroyed. Thousands of Jews are arrested. Jewish children expelled from German schools. Jews' passports stamped with a red letter J. Some of passports were moved to prevent them from leaving the country. In 1939, a central office for Jewish immigration set up. Jews evicted from their homes without reason and notice. Jews' radios confiscated. Jews' curfew established. 1940, Jews' telephones confiscated. Jews no longer received ration cards for clothes. 1941, their the Jews over six are forced to wear a yellow star of David with Jews written on it. Jews forbidden to use public telephones. Forbidden to keep dogs, cats, and birds. Forbidden to leave the country. 1942, they're they hand over fur coats and, and woolen items. Not allowed to receive eggs or milk. Blind or deaf Jews no longer allowed to wear armbands identifying their condition in traffic. All school, schools closed to Jewish children. 1943, continued deportation in concentration camps. So, go to the next slide, son, but don't let play yet, okay? Enter a little girl named Anne Frank. Now, I know that was a little bit, you know, like, long, and it was kind of like, oh my God, you know, I came to church for that. This is the reality. Yeah. This is a reality, though, because people ask these questions, and I'll tell you who did. You guys have heard of Billy Graham, right? Billy Graham was like the biggest evangelism out there, evangelist out there. He had another guy named Chuck Templeton that did evangelism with him. Chuck ended up turning his back on God. Chuck walked out of his church of over 10,000 people and said one day, I can no longer preach what I don't believe. If you look up the name Chuck Templeton, you'll find out his history. Him and there was another gentleman and Billy Graham, they all went out together and evangelized the world. Chuck started to see these clips and said, how can a loving God allow that? Where is he? Where is 
complicity in this. Take a look at this video about Anne Frank. This is the only living video that they have of her was actually because she couldn't leave the annex, but she was up literally living in an attic with her family. Take a look. In 1941, there was a wedding at Merveda Plain in Amsterdam. After filming the people in the street, the cameraman pointed his camera at the onlookers above. There at the window was Anna Frank. This is the only known moving footage of her. sunny day in June, it's not surprising that the 12-year-old Anna Frank was yet to find her life's purpose. But less than three years later, as she sat caged in the fragile security of her hiding place, she had discovered her destiny. Wednesday, April 5th, 1944. My dearest Kitty, I don't want to have lived in vain like most people. I want to be useful or bring enjoyment to people even those I've never met. I want to go on living even after my death. And that's why I'm grateful to God for having given me this gift, which I can use to develop and to express all that's inside me. Yours, Anna M. Frank. just of it. Here this girl dies of typhus three years later in a concentration camp. Starved to death. And look at the attitude she had though. And look at how she said how grateful she was to God. And she talked about living one past. She had told her father that she wanted to write a book on the war. And guess what? She did in her journal. That's what she called Kitty by the way. And he found it because the father was the only survivor of the family. Her and her sister died in the same camp. Their family was separated as soon as they got off that cattle car. So the question is, where was God? Where was he? Six million Jews were, were killed because of one man's madness. Was God present? When they went into the gas ovens, which you see on the right, when they turned on the showers only to have gas coming out of the spouts instead of water, the unbelievable answer is yes. I don't have the answers for it all. But whatever you're going through in life, he's there with us all the way through it and then some. We all are going to die. I know, real encouraging, Steve. Thanks for bringing me to church someday to hear that one, right? But here's what I'm saying. It is the truth. Does God leave us in that time period? No. Sin lives in the world. This is a fallen world. Bad things happen. Can he intervene? Absolutely. But there are times where he will allow us to grow with him to say, child, I'm still here with you. It's easy if you saw somebody and heard somebody say it, but by faith you're believing that God is there with you even in those times of darkness. Yes, this is a little, this is very deep. But God wanted me to show it. Because whenever I get in my belly aching mood, because the Wi-Fi doesn't work, because I don't have hot water, because my family took a shower before me, and I think the end of the world has happened, I'm going, really God? I need some hot water in the house. Come on, let's go. But look at what she went through. Look at what those people went through. And there are a lot of people today that are going through things like that. We just don't hear about it. And by the way, in Cumberland County alone, we had people at the, at the Love Thy Neighbor that needed shoes. Asked Ani for a, uh, a pair of pajama bottoms. Because they didn't have them. This stuff goes on all the time. And many people's question is, is God really there? 
Where is God? The decisions that we make as a society, as human beings, have a grand effect on things. And if God intervened in every single thing of it, then it wouldn't be what it is. He has his reasons that I don't necessarily have an answer for to, to tell you today. But I am going to say this. He's there when we think that he's not. He's with us when all hell's breaking loose. Next slide. Was God there when Abraham was about to sacrifice his one only son? The answer is... When Moses cried out to, for, for God to save him and the Hebrews from Pharaoh? Yes. When Job couldn't understand how sudden calamity came upon him for no reason? Yes. When Esther put her life on the line and approached the king without asking in order to save the Jewish people? Yes. When David cries out to God to save him from King Saul trying to kill him? Yes. When Peter walked on water until he looked at the waves around him and started to drown? When Paul was near death, being stoned to death, um, cold, hungry, beaten. Yes. When Jesus himself was in the Garden of Gethsemane crying out to the Father to take this cup from him, but it didn't happen, the answer is yes. That is a key scripture right there, and that picture I loved. Because we think of Jesus, he's the Son of God, he's... he's you know, he's above and rules and reigns and everything. But when he was in, in human form, it says, the scripture said that he was sweating blood. And so we turn around and say, God, you don't know what I'm going through. Check out the scriptures again. Were you nailed to a cross for the sins of the world? Were you ripped apart before it happened? Did you have people constantly wanting to kill you? People that didn't believe in him, and then he gets to that spot, and he knows he's going to die, and he's sweating blood on the stone and saying, "Father, if there's another way, take this cup from me." Oh, let me. Let me here we go. Guys. Okay, here it is. When you when you look at that 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 scripture, and he talks about you know if there's another way to pass the cup, but not my will, but yours. As Christians, I think we really like we got it the opposite way. We want the problem to go away, take two Bible scriptures and, and see me in the morning and everything will be fine. But the, the issue is, do we want to grow? And if you want to grow, you're going to have to go through some stuff. You've heard me say it before. We look to avoid it, God says go through it. Did you catch that? We say avoid it, he says go through it. But he says go through it with my power, with my word. With my spirit, says the Lord. Go through it with him. So everything looks like it's falling apart. You have nobody around you to really understand you. And you're going, okay, what do I do? And he says, go forward in my name. In my name. Go forward. But what do we do? We look for the, the easy way out, right? We look for if it just goes away... Our prayers look like this. God, just take this away. Take this away. Take this away. And then something happens and it takes away. And Thank you, Lord. And then something else comes in. God, take this away. Take this away. Take this away. It's the wrong prayer. The prayer should be, I thank you, Lord, because I know what you're going to do through this. I thank you, Lord, because when all hell breaks loose, I know that you said you'll never leave me nor forsake me. I know that when I feel alone, you are with me. You will not let my foot slip. Your word says it. Read Psalm 37 when you get a chance. Read Psalm 121 when you get a chance. And David confirmed that and said, I know that even in my darkest hour, you, will, you watch my coming and going. You will be with me. My foot will not slip from under me. You've got me. Even though I know that I don't know how this all this is going to go down. You still have me. If you're going through something right now, and if you're not, stick around because you will. And you go through a trial, we have to remind ourselves of God's word. And if we're not in the Bible, and again, I say this statistic quite often. I think it's like an average of like 10 to 15% of Christians 
to even read the Bible, let alone believe in it. And what we've done is we've said, I don't really believe that ancient book because it really isn't kind of like relevant to this day. But then we go back around and we go, Pastor, I got a problem, I got a problem, pray it away, pray it away. No. The Word of God says, man does not live on bread alone, but in every word that comes from the mouth of God. He told Moses, God told Moses, speak to the rock. Moses decided to strike it. Hence, he didn't go into the promised land. When God says speak it, you better speak it. I'm learning this myself, by the way. So I don't want to, to tell you I've mastered this and everybody else has got the problem. I'm learning it myself because I have played the victim for so long. And now I'm not doing it anymore. I'm getting up and demanding and declaring and decreeing. And by the way, a decree is a law that a king says. When a king gives a signet ring and says it is law, there is no turning back. God's word is the same way. When he says it, we have to believe it. You either take it to the house, it's seven in football language, or it's not. So when your, your bank account is laughing at you, do we believe that he will never leave us nor forsake us? Do we believe that if we give, it will be given unto you? Uh-oh. You want to get out of poverty? Give. This isn't a prosperity message, okay? But I'm telling you because my wife and I are doing it. And been doing it for a long time. You want to get out of, out of poverty? Give. Give to his house. And in the offering, it's your choice. But the tithe comes back to him. Give, and it'll be given unto you. It's a simple formula. The question is, are you willing? I didn't plan on saying that. I'm saying that many people are in the predicament they're in because they don't believe and recite the word of God. They don't command their day. They don't, they don't take authority over it. And I'm one of them. And I'm getting an eye opener right now that I have read the Bible all wrong. Did you guys get that? And you're like, oh my God, what did I come to today? He's reading the Bible all wrong and now he's telling us this. Listen guys, I don't mean like, you know, oh wow, Jesus is really God. No, I don't mean that. I'm saying that I'm not looking at it in the perspective that I think God wanted me to see, which is his words are powerful. His word is powerful. And there's, there's death and life in the power of the tongue, it says. Which means that every time that I go and I say something like this, my wife says, listen, I think my mom has to come back and live with us for a little while. And it might be for a long time. Oh, God, I know what that's going to mean. Oh, my God, no. This is going to happen. That's going to happen. She's going to be like this. This is going to be that way. That's going to be the other way. You know what I just did? I pronounce all kinds of stuff over our situation that don't belong there. Yeah, thank you. And, 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 you know, have you ever done that? Am I the only crazy one here? Have you said something like, it's like all of a sudden, it's like, you know, um, you get called to the boss's office. That was a good one of mine. All right? Back when I worked here. Steve, can I see you for a second? Sure. Walk in. Before I even got to sit down, I'm like, they're going to fire me. They're going to fire me. I didn't do anything wrong. But already I got in my head, they're going to fire me. I'm going to go home. I'm not going to have a job. My wife's going to throw me out. This is going to be bad. This is going to be real bad. And he calls me in and he says, listen, I just want to tell you what a great job you're doing. We just gave you a raise. <laughs> stupid, 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 right? But here I am saying, I'm already pronouncing death over the whole situation when I don't even know what the heck it is. Oh, am I the only one? Well, it'll never be. That person will always be. Says who? Says who? The person that you think will never change and never accept the Lord, I challenge you to pray over that person and declare a decree that he says he desires no one to spiritually perish but all to have eternal life. And it might be a long time before you see that. But guess what? His answer is, his answer to prayers of yes and amen. But are we speaking death over it saying that person will never change? Oh, uh, this person at Code Blue, they're back again. They're a drunk. They're not going to change. We're just here to just, you know, babysit you and that's it. I get mad at them sometimes. Mary knows. My wife
wife knows. I'm like, back again, huh? I said, how long is it going to take you before you hit rock bottom? And I'm saying that to the person because I know they know God. Well, Pastor Steve, no, don't Pastor Steve me. How bad do you want it? See, if we really want something, if we want to get closer to God, we're going to do it. If we want to sin, we're going to do it. Where's the fire in the belly? Do we want to start learning God's word? Do we want to start understanding that we can wake up in the morning and declare a decree over the spirit of anxiety and depression that is at you already before your feet even come down the ground and say, Lord, I speak to that right now that your word says that you'll never leave me nor forsake me. You love me unconditionally and that worrying is not of you. Who can add an extra hour to their day by worrying? If you take care of the birds of the air and the grass of the field, how much more you owe me a little faith? And I would wake up, thank you, and I, and I wake up and I have this, this problem all the time where I keep doing this repetitive thing. And you know, Facebook is so important, I have to look at that first before I do anything else. Right? And now it's come down to, or before I even do that, I'm thanking God already for a great day. It's making a change. It really is happening. I'm going, wow, this is pretty cool. And so waking up and going, oh, what now? What's going to happen now? Dog probably threw up in the living room. Oh, I'm going to get breakfast. Let me go sit down and do my devotionals. Repeat process. Who's going to beat me up today? Here we go. Okay, this problem. Do you, you see what I'm getting at, guys? Yeah. yeah. He's present in everything. He spoke creation. He's in everything. He's here with us. We can tap into him at any given time. Any given time. Next one, son. His word proclaims it. In Colossians, Paul says, all creation is dependent upon his presence. When Jesus was on the cross and, and dying, the world was falling apart. Because God is the one, is the glue. He's the one that put it all together. You imagine if the sun comes in one degree, we're all dead. We fry. One degree. Just, just tilt off a little bit. One degree, we're all done. If an asteroid came and hit this earth and took it out, or, or something catastrophic, who's to stop it? You fire all the nuclear weapons you want at it, but if it's coming at you and it's going to destroy it, it's done. But God spoke it, and there it is. He, he said it and said, this is what it is. I've got to spin it right on my finger. And guess what? He says that about our lives. I've created you fearfully and wonderfully. I know every hair on your head. I know everything about you. I know my plans and purpose for you. Plans not to harm you, but to prosper you. To give you hope in the future. I know everything about you from start to finish. Not one person in the world has the same DNA. So I guess that evolution thing is kind of suspect, huh? Not one. No, 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 no. One. Not one. Not one person. He cares that much that he would do that and say, I have a purpose for you. I have plans for you. I have a job for you to do here. The question is, are we calling on him? Or are we trying to do it on our own? And when you think that he's let you go, he hasn't. He hasn't. Scripture says in Hebrews, God's continual presence brings contentment. It says in Psalms, we read it, God is everywhere and no one can escape him. Don't be fooled by people who are atheists and think there is no God and it's just, you know, he's just not around. Oh, he's doing stuff behind the scenes. They just don't see it or they want to deny it. He's everywhere. You ever see, you know, somebody says, oh, that's a coincidence. You're talking about that when I'm going through this. And you didn't meet me before. No, that's not a coincidence. That's God working behind the scenes. Oh, when you know it, that you meet this person and you were just talking about that the other day and here this person comes to help you out with this. Coincidence? No. 
Luck? Absolutely not. It's all him. He's got this whole thing orchestrated. He is like the master orchestrator going like this. But then when we see things that look out of control because of the things that we've done, we have a choice and a chance to make a difference and change it. If you don't like your life, you do realize that we all have a chance to change it. If, if I don't, if I just decide I'm not eating those chips over there, I just don't do it. Nobody forces me. I just don't do it. I have a choice to make. If I don't want to smoke, drink, do whatever, my choice. Do it or don't. You want to live the way you're living right now? Your choice. I don't get upset with people anymore. I used to. And now when I have people that come to the church and I see some things going on or whatever, and I kind of like give them a little bit, and they're like, no, 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 that's okay. I'm like, hey, hey, man, you. Love you. You're welcome here. I'm not going to spend any more time on it. Until you're ready, until your heart is saying, okay, I need that change, that's between you and God. My job is not to babysit people. My job is to, to encourage them, to guide them, and sometimes speak the truth in love. But it's for their benefit. My son... I can tell him all day long, don't do this or don't do that. He's got choices to make. He makes the wrong choice. I can't help you. Right? But God is ever present. He's ever present. No task is too large or difficult for him. That's in Jeremiah. And finally, one cannot hide from God. You can't hide from him. Jonah tried that, that deal, and he ended up in the belly of the fish, trying to run from God. Can you imagine? Yeah, we can, because we do it all the time. He tells you to do something you don't want to do. What we do, in our spirit, we go on a boat ride. We get down to town. Listen, I, tell, I used to tell my wife all the time, I said, there's plenty of parts of the United States and plenty of parts of the world that we can leave, leave Millville in a heartbeat. I'm not tied to it. Yeah, I'm born here, but I'm not tied to it. And she goes, really? You're going to speak against the calling that you have? She said, that's going to affect both of us and the people in the church. So I had to stop saying it. Because it was affecting things. And now, I stand where I stand. I teach what I teach. Learn what I learn. And put one foot forward every day. And as we do that as a church and as a team... There are many things that we've yet experienced, but there's going to be great things. But if you don't start learning the Word of God and start being able to recite things, you're missing out, not just on a power trip, because this isn't about that, but it's about watching the power of God through you to change lives. If you wake up and look at the glass half empty, and that's what you do, to declare and decree in your day, that's what you're going to get. If you look the other way with it, and you declare that it is a good day, you're setting out and setting the sail this way, God will go forward with you. It doesn't mean it won't be easy, but He'll go forward. We have choices. If you have a wilderness mentality, like the Israelites did when they were in complaining in the wilderness, 11 day trip took 40 years and only the younger generation saw the promised land, not the older. Why? Because they whined, complained, and didn't believe. <laughs> they saw his, they saw the miracles he was doing. They heard him and yet they didn't, they didn't believe. And so therefore they didn't go in. They didn't believe he would be with them. When they've seen him. So I'm going to close it with this. I don't care where you are in life, where you are right now, where you're going to be, the same rule applies. You're going to have opposition. You're going to have people that are going to come against you. It might even be people in this church. It could even be me. Whatever. When you speak God's word and call on his presence and know that he's with you, it doesn't matter. Because at the end of the day, he's never going to leave us or forsake us. You have problems, I have problems, we all have things that we're going through, but he's with us every step of the way. 
All we have to do is say, Dad! And there he is. And the way to do that is to go through the Son, which is Jesus Christ. If you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, it would be a tragedy for me not, not give you this invitation, the greatest invitation you'll ever have. And there's many invitations that people have probably given you with birthdays and weddings and different things like that. But this one, this is the greatest one you'll ever hear. And it's this. For God so loved the world, he gave his own one and only Son. Whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. We have to turn from our ways and admit that we're wrong and that he's right. So we kind of say it like this, it's as simple as ABC. A, you've got to admit the truth about yourself, that your sin separates you from the Holy God. B, you got to believe that God did something about the problem. He didn't leave us in it. And he gave us Jesus. So we believe in him as our Lord and Savior because of what he did on the cross. We don't have to go through it. C, is we commit to making that commitment to following him all the days of our life. And then we slide on a day to do it today. Because you don't know when your last breath may be. Guys, listen. There's some, there, there, I know there are more than one person here right now that thinks that God has abandoned you. He hasn't. He's waiting for you to call on him. He's wooing you to him because he loves you. He's waiting for you to make a move. That wall is a move, it's brick. If I run into it, I don't care how hard I run into it, I'm not going through it. But if I come up and speak to the wall, you never know what can happen. Don't run into the wall anymore. Throw in the towel. It's a sign of strength, not weakness. I surrender, Lord. You take hold of my life. You take hold of my situation. I can't do this without you. I can't, I can't go on like this. It's time for a change. You guys want change? You really want change? Then today's a new day, isn't it? Stop the insanity, which is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. We have Bibles. Take one. If you have a smartphone, you can download an app. I can show you how. Read the Word of God. Study it. Memorize it. It's worth it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord God, for what you have done in your Lord. God, we thank you and praise you, knowing that all we got to do is call on our Heavenly Daddy. He's right there. I thank you, Lord, for giving us your son, Jesus. It gives us access to you. You've also given us your Holy Spirit. That is the power that, that, that raised Jesus from the dead that now lives inside of those who know you. I pray, Lord, that we will activate that power. That we will grow stronger with you. That we will grow closer to you. That we will feel like you're right there with us in the room. God, I just pray for your people. I pray for all of us, Lord, that we grow closer to you. We know opposition will come because the enemy does not want that. Satan does not want us to get close. But Lord, when we speak your word and speak through our situations and take control over it because of your power and your power only, Lord, we have victory. And I pray, Lord, victory for our church. Victory in this city. Victory in the state, victory in the nation, in the world. That Christians all over will be united. And that your spirit will once again pour out a new thing in people. That people will see that you're not far off. We don't know where you're at. And we just got to handle on our own. No, uh -uh. you're right here with us, ever present. One of your main attributes. Lord, if there's anybody here that doesn't know you, Father, I pray that they have called out to you. And I ask, Lord, that as we go on our way, we have social time and pray and so forth. Father, may we just take a moment from this service and just let it resonate in our hearts and minds. That with you, Lord, you're, you'll never leave us nor forsake us. When we're alone and we
we feel like nobody understands, you're right there with us sitting there saying, I know, child, I know. Let there be peace in here today, Lord, as Ani prayed, and as Anna Marie paved the way, and I just ask, Lord, that that peace will just flood this auditorium, and it will go out into the city, out into our homes, that we can be still and know that you are God. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, we're going to have, uh, over here we call it the war room. We have a couple of our prayer warriors that will be up here momentarily. If you guys need prayer, come up. Um, I'm going to ask because we're kind of doing our social time inside here. If you guys just kind of keep your voices down if anybody is over here praying. I'm going to stay up here for a minute. If anybody wants to come up and pray. If you want to talk to me, I can do that afterward. But if you want prayer, I'm here to pray now. Matter of fact, honey, if you come up with me. Come up here and, and my wife and I will be here to pray. And anybody else that wants to pray, we have some people here. Some of our leaders can come and pray with you. Whether it's privately or over here or whatever. Don't leave the burden that you brought in here. Don't leave it. Or I should say leave it. <laughs> Don't take it with you. God bless you guys.